Dr. Marzia Saison from the University of Houston, and she'll be talking to us about deep learning-based uh, blood glucose predictors in type 1 diabetes. Yes, um, thank you, Eric, for the, for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It is my pleasure to be here and share with you some work that we have done at the University of Houston uh, on predicting blood glucose with uh, deep learning methods. But let me first of all introduce some context and, uh, and motivation. So what is diabetes and why we are interested in studying it? So diabetes is a serious condition. It's a chronic metabolic, metabolic disorder resulting from dysfunction of the pancreatic beta cells. Okay? As a result, the body cannot produce any or enough insulin or cannot effectively use the insulin it produces. As a consequence, blood glucose remains high in the uh, portal circulation and leads to long-term complications, so damage, dysfunctions, and failure of various organs. Currently, there are about 400 million individuals in the world living with diabetes, and this figure is forecasted to increase twofold in roughly 30 years from now. In the North American region, which we can see here in, uh, in green, we have about 50 million individuals, and one in six adults in this region is at risk of developing diabetes. Together, we account for roughly the 40% of the global uh, diabetes-related healthcare expenditures in the entire world. So we are truly living in a diabetes epidemic, and we have the responsibility of developing tools and methods to curb this epidemic and also to provide a better um, uh, life and, and care for patients. So I'm going to be focusing on type 1 diabetes especially, which is the current uh, research uh, focus of my group. Type 1 uh, patients require frequent user intervention to manage uh, their disease. So they take uh, glucose measurements, uh, as you can see here in the figure, with the sensor which is inserted into the skin, measuring almost continuously 5 to 15 minutes the glucose concentration into the interstitial fluid, Based on the feedback obtained uh, with these measurements or self-monitoring of blood glucose, that is a drop of blood is taken from the finger, and the knowledge that the patient have about their own glucose metabolism, they administer insulin exogenously, according to the so-called basal bolus therapy. So a basal uh, insulin dose provides a background insulin concentration to uh, guarantee normal glycemia in the fasting condition. And a bolus is given in case of a disturbance. I'm going to be talking about a little bit uh, later uh, on this. Insulin is delivered either via a pump uh, here in the figure or via syringes. So the overall objective of uh, the management is to keep glucose concentration in the green zone. So between 70 and 180 milligrams per deciliter. A, a glucose level higher than that, so-called hyperglycemia, leads to the long-term complication, but also too low uh, glucose levels, so-called hypoglycemia, levels below 70 milligrams per deciliter, can lead to short-term complications, such as seizure, coma, and death. So optimal insulin dosing is, is challenging and requires a constant decision-making by the patient and their caregivers to compensate the effect of the disturbances. And here in the, in the slide, we see different cartoons exemplifying uh, meal disturbance, exercise, stress, and, and sleep. So as we said, uh, keeping glucose concentration in the green zone is very important as it can drastically reduce the potential chances of hyper and hypoglycemia and limit the impact of the complications. Our goal against this background is to provide the patient, which is sitting here uh, in the cartoon, with a forecasted uh, glucose level, which can be uh, delivered uh, by a smartphone applications. Uh, the predictions are used to compute uh, future therapy interventions, such as the type and amount of insulin to be uh, injected, but also recommendations on how to modulate the therapy, such as changes in the dietary composition of the meal or promote healthy behavior, such as go for a walk, uh, all aiming at increasing the time uh, that BG is spending into the normal glycemia range. So that said, our objective is to design predictive methods to forecast blood glucose levels in people with type 1 diabetes. Now, learning a blood glucose predictor from physiological signals, such as the CGM and insulin intake, which we see here, and daily routine information, the meal intake, is not a new endeavor. 
And as a matter of fact, in the past, the literature has seen uh, the development of uh, data-driven methods to estimate autoregressive, autoregressive movement average with or without the exogenous in input, the insulin or, or the meal. Uh, the main drawback of these methods is that their structure, the structure of the model, is fixed and the unknown parameters are identified from a very short chunk of data. As a result, this model are very good and accurate at predicting glucose in that interval of time, but are very poor at adapting to the physiology of the uh, metabolic system of the patient. An alternative to the polynomial and state space models are the machine and deep learning based methods, which can actually have the capability of handling large, larger amount of data. So together with the traditional machine learning, um, random forest and support vector regressors, uh, in recent years, artificial deep neural networks have been proposed, such as the convolution neural networks and the long short term memory L LSTM. In our work, we propose a convolutional neural network, long short term memory, so in hybrid CNN LSTM architecture, with the main advantage of the automatic feature instruction, as well as the sequence learning, while having a multivariate data set, a time series data set to begin with. So here on the left, we can see the input, and in this study, we considered the CGM for feedback measurement, the carbohydrate intake of the meal, and uh, the, uh, the insulin. So this input segment is sent to a multi-layer CNN block. Then the CNN block is extracting features which are flattened and fed into a two-layer LSTM block here toward the right for temporal dynamic analysis. Finally, the learned features are passed through two fully connected layers uh, to be interpreted and result in the uh, blood glucose uh, output prediction. So we have evaluated our approach on two experimental data sets. The first one is a 168 adult uh, patient data set um, recorded in free living conditions. And the second is a three days in hospital and uh, dialysis uh, data set. So here in the bottom, uh, you can see three uh, days for one representative patient. We have day one, day two, and day three, taken actually from the advisor data set, where the time is on the x-axis. On the top panel, uh, we have glucose concentration, the continuous signal in blue, measured by the uh, CGM sensor. We have the meal intake, divided in carbohydrate, uh, fat and, and protein content of the meal. And in the bottom, we have the insulin intake. So the blue is the basal. Remember I said that the basal glucose concentration, basal insulin dose should provide a background uh, for 24 hours. That's why the dose is larger. The bolus for the disturbances is in red. And then in green, we have some correction. So those are the patients uh, take when they feel they have to adjust their therapy. Now, uh, we have evaluated the proposed approach on uh, the unseen test data, according to the 80-20 split. And with respect to the mean absolute error in milligrams per deciliter, the root mean square error in milligrams per deciliter, and the R2 uh, metric in percentage. We have performed a population-wise uh, analysis having one generalized predictor. So on the left panel, we can see performances for the replaced BG data set, so the free living conditions. And on the right, we have the uh, in-hospital uh, trial. You can see that the performances are, are similar and they match one another. We have mean absolute error on the left, root mean square error in the middle, and R2 uh, on the right. Uh, we evaluate 30 minutes prediction horizon in blue, 60 minutes prediction horizon in orange, and uh, 90 minutes prediction horizon in uh, green. We are particularly interested in evaluating the performances for the 60 minutes prediction horizon because that would uh, be sufficient time for the patient to take actions and, and modify the therapy accordingly. So here we have box plot and uh, I remember the, the central mark is the median and the edges are the 25th and the 75th uh, percentile. And here for the mean absolute error for 60 minutes prediction horizon, we have roughly 12 milligrams per deciliter of error 
for the uh, free living conditions and 14 for the uh, advisor data set. Root mean square error lies between 16 and 18 uh, milligrams per deciliter and the R2 coefficient is almost 90%. Uh, so we were very happy with these results performed um, uh, retrospectively. Now, in addition to these metrics, we have evaluated the clinical acceptability of the proposed uh, predictor as well with the so-called continuous glucose error grid analysis, CGEGA. So the CGEGA was a metric developed by the clinician to help them assess how good the predictors were in the clinical practice. So in the left, we have the point error grid analysis, which, which is actually evaluating predictions point-wise. So we plot the predicted glucose values, uh, y-axis, against the true glucose values. And ideally, we would like all the points to lie in the A zone, okay, the uh, accurate prediction uh, in clinician metrics. On the right panel, we have the rate error grid analysis. That means we are evaluating the rate of change between two consecutive points, predicted y-axis uh, versus true rate of change in the uh, x-axis. Here as well, similarly to what we uh, have said before, uh, we want all the points to lay uh, in the A and B uh, zone. And for this representative example of CGEJ, we are also doing a pretty good job. Now, let me show you uh, how uh, the prediction would look like, suppose we implement it into a smartphone application. So in solid, the solid red is a historical window uh, of data that uh, we use. The ground truth that uh, we compare our predictors against is the dashed uh, line in red. 30 minutes prediction horizon is here in blue. 60 minutes prediction horizon is in the orange. And the 90 minutes prediction horizon is the green. As you can see, they follow the ground truth uh, pretty nicely. Now, um, our approach to interstitial glucose prediction based on a CNN LSTM model reliably pre predicts retrospective clinical CGM data, both in the short, say 30 minutes uh, ahead, and the long term, up to 90 minutes uh, ahead. Our current focus now is to incorporate um, other glycemic disturbances, such as exercise and stress, which we can uh, assess from wearable devices. So we can estimate the intensity and the type of physical activity with the accelerometer data from a wearable device, as well as we can um, assess the stress level via uh, some algorithms and tools that we have developed to manage the electrodermal activity, so the galvanic skin response, again, with a wrist-worn uh, device. Uh, our hope is that we can improve the performances of our BG predictive model to be able to handle all circumstances. Ultimately, we would like to integrate our AI-based predictive and classifier algorithms with a controller, which we can see here on the bottom in the loop, to design a closed loop system that can exploit physiological signals to make decision for automated insulin delivery. And this concludes my talk. Uh, I'm happy to take questions. Wonderful talk. Thank you very much. Um, so I had a question while we wait for any from the chat. Oh, um, so you mentioned okay. that one of your objectives is to regulate blood glucose mm -hmm. uh, in the presence of stress, among other factors. Mm -hmm. How do you envision closing the loop on stress and what control strategy do you plan? Yes, um, we plan to use the electrodermal activity measured by, for instance, the Empatica device, medical grade uh, device, perform deconvolution of that signal so that we can retrieve the neural stimuli and then apply some expectation maximization algorithm that are able to help us retrieve the cognitive stress state of, of the patients and correlate that with the glycemic variability. So we can have models that relate to glucose with the stress, okay? And then ultimately we can implement um, 
fuzzy logic controller or uh, more model-based controllers such as the PID or modability controller to give actionable information, suggestions, for instance, go for a walk if you want to decrease your stress, or maybe um, regulate the light in your house if you want to wind down with the hope of decreasing glucose concentration. So without the need of injecting extra insulin. Very interesting. Um, my background is in, in genetics, actually. Have you looked at all at uh, the genetic background of patients and whether that's something that helps set up yes. baseline? Uh, not in my analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, I have colleagues that are doing genetic analysis, but mm -hmm. uh, we're not interested in um, um, predicting the chances and the risk that the patient has to develop uh, diabetes. It's more how to uh, control it. Gotcha. Well, thank you very much for thank a wonderful you. talk.